Ah. Ah. This is this the um, all right. It came on my computer that it's it's being yeah. live streamed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. Welcome to the encore presentation of attracting beneficial insects to your garden. Uh, by the our own resident expert, Ann Brown. Ann? Oh, thank you. And good evening to door. everyone. Good evening to everyone. Um, my email will be on uh, all of the handouts that I have given you. Uh, I wanted to say something about the handouts. Um, there are four of them. The seven step process to restoring native habitat. Uh, it includes keystone plants for the southeast. It also includes a butterfly and moth host plant uh, uh, table and uh, a humane way to prevent uh, carpenter bee damage. Because every time I give a talk, everybody wants to know how to kill carpenter bees and I wish they would not. And so please, if you have a problem with carpenter bees, look at this handout. Uh, I live on Lookout Mountain and I garden on Lookout Mountain. And uh, Lookout Mountain is a Bee City site, and I am one of the co-chairs for Bee City. And since 19, uh, since 2017, we have added uh, almost two acres of pollinator gardens uh, in public places on the mountain. Plus, we have um, many, many very nice um, individual. Uh, pollinator garden. So we're very proud of, of what we what we are doing up there. Uh, my yard uh, is uh, pesticide free and an organic habitat for wildlife. I've been gardening in this yard since 2010. And so I've had a lot of time to move my yard from um, a yard that was overrun with invasive plants to one that and now is um, has uh, pollinator gardens, about 150 different species of native plants. Uh, my yard uh, blooms uh, spring, summer, and into the early winter. The reason for this is that on the mountain, uh, we can have, in the past, we've had late winters. That means that there's no hard frost in December. And so I can have butterflies and bees and all sorts of insects buzzing around early in uh, December. And I do wanna recommend something that blooms in November and December, and it's a, called a climbing aster. And you can get it at Overhill Gardens, but this is what it looks like. And it blooms for about four to five weeks, depending on the weather. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I use the lazy mon uh, lawnmower approach uh, because studies show that chemical free lawns mowed every two weeks support the most bees. Uh, I've added clover to my yard and also I mow high. Uh, these are the organizations that have impacted my uh, garden, how I have developed it. And of course, I've been a master gardener since 2010. And I have uh, volunteered at, at Reflection Writing since 2010. And so all of these organizations have helped guide me in my yard. Uh, and these are the authors who have influenced me the most. And I highly recommend all of these books. Uh, Douglas Tallamy is a very famous um, professor of, of of uh, conservation at the University of Delaware and all of his books are so very important if you're going to create a garden for beneficial insects. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you tonight comes from his research and his books. The other one that's very important to my yard is the one by Heather Home. It's called Bees, an Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide. And it is so important because in this book, there is a picture of the native plant. And then there's a two page spread that shows and discusses the different insects that are attracted by this plant. And she also has just come out with a very important book on wasps. 
Uh, I do have a certified uh, butterfly garden. And so I have used Rita Venerable's book, Butterflies of Tennessee, extensively because with each uh, butterfly that is identified in the book, she does tell us uh, what to plant that they nectar on, what plants they nectar on, and what plants they host on. The other thing that's so valuable is that she does give you advice on what plants not to put in your garden because they could be invasive or take over your garden. Uh, years ago, I went to a lecture by Lee Reich and I have used his book, Weedless Gardening to establish my, uh, my, the beds in my uh, yard. And uh, he has an organic uh, no-till sy uh, system that I have used. The last one is uh, a book about the insect crisis in the world today. There's lots of articles now in the paper. There are lots of books written about this. Uh, one thing is that I wanted to say that Douglas Ptolemy has launched a, a new program called uh, Start a New Habitat Homegrown National Park. And I have registered my yard on this website and I will talk more about this later. And one of the things that these uh, books talk about is the insect apocalypse or the insect crisis. And most of these authors are saying, we're creating a world where only cockroaches, mosquitoes, starlings, and house sparrows can survive. Okay, so I am going to talk about uh, what scientists see as ecological emergencies today. Um, as you can see from these statistics on the screen, our insects have declined by 75% in the last 50 years. And the World Wildlife Fund reports that planet Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife. Well, why is this happening? Well, uh, research shows that 90% of our natural world in the lower 48 states ha have been developed and made unnatural. Our cities, suburbs, and all that goes with them, such as golf courses, roads, bridges, shopping centers, take up 54% of the land in the United States. 41% of the land is in agricultural production. So that leaves only 5% for wildlife. And you know, wildlife needs habitat, food and shelter to survive and reproduce. And we need robust populations of our fellow creatures to keep our ecosystems healthy. And I would say that most people in the United States think of nature and wildlife as something that you go to a national, a state, or a local uh, park to experience. The idea that we could coexist with uh, nature and wildlife has never been much a part of our uh, Western or age, Asian mi mindset. So we are facing emergency, um, ecological emergencies. And I hope that I convince you that there is a need to bring nature and wildlife back into our yards and gardens, because I do feel like we can make a difference. This next slide is what is called a species scape, and it is created to show you the importance of the different animal species by size in our uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Insects make up 80% of all animal species. There are over 1 million uh, insect species and they are the biological foundation of all of our terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, E.O. Wilson said many years ago, it's the little things that run the world. And he um, pointed out that if mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to its um, rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment will collapse into chaos. So what do the in insects do for our ecosystems? First of all, they pollinate our flowering plants. They decompose dead plants and insects. They disperse seeds. 
They maintain soil and structure and, for, and fertility. They control populations of other organisms. They're beneficial. And they are themselves a vital source of food. Okay, the major things that are stressing our insects are of course urbanization, overpopulation, and 40 million acres of lawns across the United States. And I want you to keep this in mind because we're gonna talk about how these lawns play into rewilding or trying to restore native habitat. Uh, and this pollution, chemical light and sound pollution, and I have light highlighted because it is recommended if you have to keep your lights on at night that they are amber colored or yellow because they are the least um, intrusive into the creatures that uh, move at night among our yards. Deforestation is another problem. Agricultural intensification, insecticides, Roundup Ready crops, just goes on and on. Invasive species of plants and animals and pathogens. And next I'm going to show you a very short video on what is happening to bees. And since bees are insects, you can get an, a very good idea of what is happening to them and how we can help them. It's called, What's Happening to Bees? What's happening with bees? When people ask me about bees, they usually don't know exactly what bees are. They often think of the honey bee, basically because it gives us honey. The honey bee is only one of the many bee species, and it is quite special because it is managed by beekeepers. But there are many more wild bees. Some are big, others small, hairy, or shiny. Some have long antennae, others short antennae. Some have a red behind, some have a yellow behind. There are more than 20,000 different species of bees in the world. For context, there are twice as many bee species as bird species. Most live solitary lives rather than nesting in colonies with a queen, and they are crucial for plants. For example, some bee species are awesome at pollinating tomatoes, while others are good with rosemary, pears, or blackberries. Altogether, they allow plants to reproduce, including most of the crops that feed us. Unfortunately, many of them are disappearing. But why? Well, the problem is complex. The main cause is that we are destroying the places where they live. We have turned woods and grasslands into crop fields and cities where many wild species cannot survive. On top of this, we use pesticides on our crops, intoxicating the few species that can adapt to them. Climate change also affects them. For example, when temperatures rise, some species are forced to find cooler places to live. If they don't find them, they simply die. Also, we are moving many species around the world. Some of them bring new diseases with devastating effects for native bees. We know that each of these things is causing some bee species to disappear. But when they happen simultaneously, the extinctions may multiply. What can we do? Well, many things. First, we need to better maintain our landscape by preserving natural areas. Also, we need to make our cities and crops more friendly for bees. For example, growing native flowers in them. We have to minimize pesticides, even avoid them if possible. We need to slow down global warming by reducing CO2 emissions, and that's not only for bees. Also, we have to be more careful to avoid moving animals indiscriminately around the world. Stopping bee decline is in our hands. In yours, too. 
Okay, so from this video, we know that bees, and of course all insects, are in decline due to the loss of habitat and a viable food web. So why should we care about food webs? Why do we need them in our yards? Well, they are highly complex and interconnected systems of feeding relationships. The earth and, its, and most species depend on them, including us. Let's look at the simplified food web that I have created that shows how the energy of the sun flows through a habitat and ecosystem. Food webs are all about fundamental relationships between those who eat and those who are eaten. To get the feast started, who has to take the first seat at the dining room table? The system all starts with plants. They are called the producers. And I have included the native plants in this food web because these are the plants that are most missing from most of our yards. Uh, plants get great publicity for their ability to convert carbon dioxide and water into uh, breathable air, but plants have another very important talent. They capture the energy from the sun and they turn it into food. Animals eat plants. Some eat plants directly. Others obtain this energy from the sun by eating an animal who has eaten a plant. And what animals are the best at conserving this energy, uh, converting, excuse me, converting this energy of the sun? Think small, very small. Insect, herbivores, and pollinators. Insects are the best creatures on earth at transferring energy. And the world champions are the herbivores or caterpillars of the Lepidoptera uh, species, it's all butterflies and all moths. They are the lifeblood of the food web. Their protein rich bodies are ID, ideal for hungry birds and other wildlife. The herbivores are what are missing from our food web and what we need to put in our yards. And the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers all depend on the primary consumers. Uh, one illustration about non-native plants and what they do in the yard is a Catoosa dogwood. This is a very popular plant from a uh, beautiful uh, tree from uh, China, but our uh, herbivores cannot eat the leaves and, they can't, and the nectar that is provided uh, for them, for our pollinators, is not nutritious. But if we plant our native dogwood, it supports 117 species of moths and butterflies. So you can see how just one plant can contribute so much to the food web. Okay, so the garden herbivores, one of the most important of the keystone insects. They eat plants, they drive nutrients through the cycle, they push nutrients through the food web and they cycle nutrients back into the ground. They convert plant protoplasm into animal life. Uh, more than 97% of the insects in our yard and gardens are beneficial that leaves less than 3% that are agricultural pests and nuisance pests. And this is a great book if you would like to um, get something that really explains it in great, great detail. Also, she has a great website and you can go to that and get ad additional information. Also, our website, the Wild Ones uh, website, has a complete section on beneficial insects. Beneficial insects fall into three categories. The pollinators, who we're all familiar with. We depend on these insects, including bees, butterflies, flies, and moths to pollinate vegetables, fruits, and flowers. Okay, the second group are the predator groups. These insects eliminate pests by eating them, uh, some of the species are ladybugs, praying mantis, green, la green lacewe uh, 
lace, excuse me, lace wing larva fall into this category. And then we have the parasitic wasps and flies. And like predators, these insects all also prey on other insects, but in a slightly different way. They lay their eggs in, on or in the bad bugs. And when the eggs hatch, of course, the larva kills the host insect. And parasitic wasps are uh, a member of this category. And there are over 6,000 different kinds of wasps. And most of them are uh, very small and tiny that you don't even see in your garden. Okay, and so let's start with the first group, which are our pollinators. And we know that they are, ex they are so important to 80% of all the plants and 90% of all flowering plants have to be pollinated. And this group is varied. It includes invertebrates, insects, and so also vertebrates such as bats and birds. I wanna say something about bats in the Southeast. They are really not uh, pollinators in the Southeast, but they're very important pollinators in the West, uh, in Mexico, Central America, and South America. Uh, wasps are very important uh, pollinators, and I'm gonna say some more about them later. later. Of course, butterflies, ants, uh, our ruby-throated hummingbirds, uh, beetles, flies. Um, flies are an extremely important uh, group of pollinators and they are only second to bees as being the most important. And we'll talk further about them. And of course, moths. And of course, our most important uh, pollinators are our bees. And when we talk about bees, just like in the video, we are not talking about honeybees. Honeybees are special, but they're not endangered. It's our native bees that are in danger. And I just have these pictures just so you can see the difference between a bumblebee and hornets, honeybee, yellow jacket, uh, our, some of our bald faced hornets that I have in my uh, yard, European hornets, we have those, those are those big orange ones and of course the yellow jackets that we all hate. And our common Eastern bumblebee is our most common uh, bee in our yards. And then of course we know that figs and the fig wasps have a very symbi symbiotic uh, relationship. F uh, fig trees are not pollinated by bees like most other crops. They're pollinated by fig wasps. And you're interested in this, you can go to, um, YouTube and see some great videos on this. Uh, they're codependent in their relationship and fig trees don't have blossoms. They don't produce an outside flower. The flowers are on the inside of the fruit and they look like seeds. And so if you're interested in this, this is very, um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, relationship between um, fig wasps and figs. And these fig wasps are so very important in uh, Southern, uh, especially Mexico, Central America and South America because uh, fig trees are a keystone species in those environments. Okay, ants are another important part of the food web. They eat a variety of organisms, materials and other insects. They provide food for many different organisms such as amphibians, birds, mammals, and carnivorous plants. They turn and aerate the soil and um, help water and oxygen reach the roots of plants. Hoverflies, I've talked about flies. They are a, a great pollinator and you will see them in your garden. They look like a bee, but their wings are shaped back like a the wings of a plain and so you can see the difference between because they just have two wings and um, bees have two wings on each side. And there are 6,000 species of flies. Okay, and of course flies uh, do uh, pollinate the uh, cocoa tree and so they are help to create the well, chocolate of course which is considered the food of the gods. Uh, keystone pollinators are also insect decomposers. So that includes flies, beetles, and ants. 
the larva stage is so is an important food source for birds and small animals. Okay, so the best pollinators are our native bees, and you'll see various counts. Some accounts say they're 3,800, some say there's over 4,000, but you can see them in relation to the European honeybee. Most of them are smaller than the honeybee, except for our bumblebee, which is, the, which is larger, and of course our carpenter bees. Okay, so we know the difference between uh, native wild bees and honeybees. Remember that honeybees are not uh, endangered. They're like chicken and pigs and cattle and other livestock. Uh, honeybees are domesticated animals and they are cared for by beekeepers. And of course we love our honeybees because of, of their pollination services and because they provide honey for us. But just remember, it's our wild bees that are endangered because we have destroyed their habitat. Okay, and the most important um, species of pollinator in North America and in Europe is our wild eastern bumblebee. And this is a video I made of um, the uh, bees and the bumblebees in my yard that love the St. Uh, John wort. Um, up. And I'm going to show you next uh, a um, video on sonification. This is one of the most important um, pollinator services that uh, the eastern um, bumblebee provides for us. Back in West Virginia, the diverse vegetation of the uncultivated areas between farmlands is home to the best known relative of the honeybee, the bumblebee. populations are in decline, a tragedy since they are among the few bees capable of buzz pollination. This technique is the only efficient way to pollinate plants like tomatoes, eggplants, and blueberries. The bumblebee grabs the flower by the anthers, decouples its flight muscles from the wings, and uses them to shake the flower violently. the only way to get the blossom to dislodge its pollen. Which the bumblebees bring back to their colony. One of the things I haven't told you is that um, according to the UN, 1.4 billion jobs worldwide depend on pollinating insects, especially bees. And so uh, the pollination services of uh, native bees, especially the Eastern bumblebee are very important to um, some of the most nutritious um, fruits and vegetables that we eat. Okay, so Butterflies and moths are also in decline, and uh, there is a way that you can reverse this trend, and that is by planting native trees, perennials, and annuals. And I have included for you a list of host plants, and I have told you the name of the moth or the butterfly and what host plant to plant for them so they can complete their life cycle. And I have tried to add all of these over the year years in my yard. It can't be done overnight, but of course I've been doing it for about 10, over 10 years. So I have most of the host plants that butterflies and moths need. I wanna say something else about moths. There are 12,000 species and there's something that we don't really think about because a lot of them are um, 
active at night, uh, but they play a, right, a vital ro role in food webs, and they're an important uh, uh, food item for songbirds, mammals, and other insects. And most of them pollinate after dark when many other pollinating animals have settled down for the night. This is one over here, this clear wing moth you would probably see in your yard. If you plant, uh, they love flocks. And so if you have flocks in your yard, you will probably see a clear wing moth. But anyway, they are important and most of them uh, are attracted by trees. And so it's all about the caterpillars uh, and uh, the larvae that are produced by uh, butterflies and moths. Okay, more beneficial insects, the predators and parasitic wasps and flies. Okay, the predators, these uh, different predators are so important. We have beetles, spiders, uh, ladybugs. This is the larva of a ladybug. Uh, the, of course, the praying mantis, the green one, not the one from Asia that's so huge that it can catch hummingbirds and kill them. And of course, green lace wings fall into this uh, category. And their larva stages are especially beneficial as they eat lots of aphids. Okay, these uh, other predators, these insects also eliminate pests by eating them. We have hoverflies, dragonflies, and soldier beetles. Okay, parasitic wasps and flies. Now these, a lot of these are very tiny and you don't ever see them, but you would see what they do to a particular uh, type of insect, especially um, caterpillars and other larvae. And they, like I said, they're very tiny and they lay their eggs inside the eggs of over 200 different insect pests, preventing the pests eggs from ever hatching in the first place. More about wasps. In order to keep our ecosystems healthy, healthy, we must recognize the contributions of these very hated and feared insects. They are very good pest controllers. They eat a variety of insects such as spiders, cockroaches, caterpillars, and flies. Uh, they're versatile pollinators. They're able to pollinate in areas that uh, butterflies cannot, butterflies and bees do not habitat, do not. Um, do not go in. Uh, they pollinate over 800 kinds of fig trees and they're flying medicine cabinets. This is something new that is being brought out. You've probably seen articles on this in the paper. Their wasp venom is used to make streptomycin, which is an antibiotic. And they're uh, doing tremendous amount of research into how they're uh, venom can use to be tr to treat arthritis, which of course all of us would love for uh, there be, to be a cure for arthritis. Okay, uh, if you are if you have a large uh, farming area where you farm uh, more than just a yard like mine, you may be interested in David Cook's. Um, he has a um, PowerPoint presentation on beneficial insects that go into how farmers can use beneficial insects in on their farms and in, well, and in your yard too. And so I highly recommend this. You can Google it and find it. Okay, uh, these are the plants that we recommend that you put in your yard to uh, attract beneficial insects, anything from the aster family, Gallardia, uh, coneflower, and holy basil. And you were yeah. um, you were frozen there for a minute on my oh. screen. Can you, okay. uh, or something, can you just go back to that previous slide yeah, and repeat sure. that? Uh, sure. I don't know if anybody else had that experience, but you just briefly okay. uh, timed out. Yeah. Okay. So the food one. nectar plants, yes. Choose anything from the aster family. It's a huge 
family and almost everything in the aster family attracts uh, good insects. So galardia, uh, coneflowers, sunflowers, and uh, sunflowers try to um, add um, the native perennial sunflowers and also the um, annuals. And you know that some of the annual sunflowers are, are uh, bred to not have any pollination, I mean, pollen. So you don't want to put those in your yard because of course that's the most, one of the most important things that bees collect. Coreopsis and goldenrod. Okay, and then these are some uh, annuals that are really good. Um, marigolds, cosmos, um, nasturtium, and holy basil. Almost any herb is good to attract uh, beneficial insects, especially if you let them go to flower. Okay, herbs and annuals. Uh, here's some other ones that are very good to attract beneficial insects. So you have bishop's fat flower or lace, bishop's lace, bachelor buttons, buckwheat. I know if you're a beekeeper, a lot of people plant these for their bees. Coriander or cilantro, especially if you let it, because it will bolt and once it gets hot and that's great, they love those. Fennel, dill and sweet. Okay, and then non-native nectar plants that are really important that I highly recommend, even though they're not native, would be your lavender, catmint, caryopteris, and veronica. These are all very um, attractive to um, beneficial insects. Okay, so changing the way we look at our yards and gardens. Um, this is a picture of Doug Ptolemy, and he is uh, urging us to look for ways to turn our yards into conservation corridors that provide wildlife habitat for insects. And um, the handout that I gave you on restoring native ha habitat is very helpful to back up what I'm going to tell you next. Because Doug Ptolemy says, in the past, we've asked one thing of our gardens that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators and manage water. How does the way we garden affect wildlife, especially insects and their life cycles? Uh, well, what we're trying to do is to move people from these conventional landscapes that um, support large weed-free green lawns that use billions of gallons of water nationwide every day to gardens that benefit benefit wildlife and people. So we're looking to add native plants, use eco-friendly garden uh, practices uh, to provide the natural resources that we need in our yards, which is food, water, cover, and a place to raise their young. So um, this is really what we're trying to do today is to move from uh, a common, uh, well, conventional landscapes that put a lot of emphasis on yards. Uh, your yard is nature's best hope. Rethinking green weed-free lawns. Uh, this is what I've done over time in my yard is I've tried to reduce my lawn area by 50%. And this is an area that I developed in 2019. And then in June, 19, uh, June 2020, this is what it looked like. So I took all, out half of the yard in this part of my backyard uh, in 2019. And I've done the same in the front yard. Okay, so uh, Doug Ptolemy is uh, trying to encourage us to bring wildlife and nature into our yards. And his goal is to convert 20 million acres of lawn to native plants. That would be half of what is in lawns today. And he calculates that this would create area, an area larger than the Everglades, Yellowstone, Yosemite, and on and on and on. And so this is really what uh, we're looking to do in the United States today. 
And if you'll notice that there have been a lot of articles in newspapers and magazines about lawns and about how detri detrimental they are to our environment. And the last one I read was titled, Kill Your Lawn Before It Kills You. Okay, so what he's trying to get us to do is to embrace nature and bring it into our yards and that we can, must become citizen conservationists. What landscapes need to offer? We need, to, we need support for a diverse and complex food web. And I'm going to show you next a video on natives and why they are the most important thing or the foundation of our food web. Uh, we need to manage local uh, watersheds. We need to move carbon from the atmosphere uh, to the soil. We need to provide food and housing for as many species of insects, especially native bees, butterflies, and moths as possible. Okay, so now we're going to see the video on natives. The foundation of our ecosystem is rooted in native plants. We use the name native for those species of plants that grew naturally in North America at the time of European settlement. Most plants require the help of animals to transfer their pollen. About 200,000 animal species globally act as pollinators. Of those, about 1,000 are vertebrates like birds, bats, and other small mammals. The major pollinators, of course, are insects like bees, wasps, and ants. Most insects, about 90%, require a native plant host to complete their life cycle. Parent birds must gather thousands of these insects to raise a single clutch of their babies. Predators, like fox, feed on animals like birds, smaller mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, all of whom are eating insects as an important part of their diets. Decomposers, like carrion beetles, mushrooms, and soil microbes, return nutrients from animals and plants to the earth. Habitat destruction breaks the circle of life. To date, 99% of North America's native prairie has been plowed under or paved over. Just since 2008, over 9 million acres of prairie have been lost. You can keep the circle unbroken. Plant natives, whether it's a few square feet or several acres, we can all make a difference. Okay, also um, many of you may have problems like I do in my yard since we are not at the very top of the mountain. We have a tremendous amount of water that runs through our yard. And so I have had to learn to um, try to plant certain plants that can stabilize and um, help this uh, flow of water. One of the places that's a good uh, help is Tennessee Smart Yards. And then also uh, this is um, the EPA Water Smart uh, pamphlet. And if you go to it on the internet, it has all sorts of good suggestions. One of the things that I've done is plant native prairie grasses. Now any prairie plant like an echinacea has a very deep root system and this helps very much to control the flow of water through your yard. And another problem I had was that my neighbor to the north decided they would clear cut their front yard and so they took down all their trees and their shrubs and of course you know tree the tree root and the tree canopy really um, will uh, protect um, heavy rainfall. Because one of the things that I have understood about climate change in Tennessee and Kentucky is that our uh, rainfall is increasing to uh, tropical levels. That means we're getting a lot of rain in a very short period of time, which is a real uh, problem for, um, for our yards, especially mine. Okay, the other thing that we want our yards to do is sequester carbon. 
And trees, because of their size, including their large root structures, um, are very good to sequester um, carbon year round. Also shrubs and perennial, perennials, especially prairie plants are uh, good. And a new study indicates native plants, despite their tendency to grow more slowly, are better at storing carbon in the soil for longer periods of time. And now we're gonna look, about, look at a soil food web because this is another food web that we really need to understand and preserve. Um, one thing that I do suggest is that if you're putting in a, a pollinator gardens, uh, native plants that you should investigate no-till methods of planting to preserve the food web, the soil food web, because the soil food web is full of all sorts of um, microscopic uh, animals that we don't know anything about. It includes bacteria and fungi, nematodes, I mean, arthropods, nematodes, and protozoa. And then, of course, our microrhizons. And chemical fertilizers, uh, especially high in nitrogen, uh, fungicides, any type of herbicide, they do destroy the soil food web. So we want to be careful about what we put, uh, how we treat the plants that are on top of the food web. And then we're going to look at a, um, a video on mycorrhizons, which are fungi. Over 80% of plants live in a symbiotic relationship with a remarkable organism called mycorrhizal fungi. Through this symbiosis, the fungi and the plant naturally develop a lifelong bond of mutual benefit that's existed for over 450 million years. Mycorrhiza is the term used to describe the symbiotic relationship between mycorrhizal fungi and a plant's root system. First, the spore of mycorrhizal fungi germinate in the soil and make their way to the nearest roots. The roots are then colonized by the fungi and mycorrhiza are established. The fungi penetrate the root and create an internal network of fungal structures inside the root cells where the plant and mycorrhizae exchange sugars and nutrients. Finally, the hyphae continue to develop outside the roots, forming an extended network of fine filaments, which cover up to 700 times more soil area than the plant's own roots. This secondary root system draws in extra beneficial nutrients and water, supporting a plant or tree for its entire lifetime. Okay, a new study in Sweden indicates that 50 to 70% of the carbon bound in the soil is from roots and the fungi that grow on them, tree roots and the fungi that grow on them. So this is a very important living creature in our soil food web. Okay, we want to preserve, preserve our pollinators. Now, I um, honor no mo may, so I don't uh, mow my yard in May at all so that the uh, flowering weeds can bloom and uh, feed the early bees that are coming out. Okay, the other thing we want to do is to remove invasives from our uh, yards and gardens. And um, my yard was very old and overgrown with most of every invasive that you can think of. And I'm still working on taking them out. Uh, you can't eradicate them completely, but you can work on them every year, which you have to do, because I have Chinese wisteria next door that grows a couple of feet every two weeks and um, can cover your plants in no time. I have... Um, the autumn clematis that is so uh, invasive. I have uh, honey, uh, Japanese honeysuckle. So I've had them all and I just work on them almost every month except in the winter when they're dormant. Uh, remember that these invasives are a green desert. They don't attract any of our insects that, that need uh, food to eat and they displace or destroy our native flora. 
and they reduce our plant diversity. And of course, they're unable to attract and support keystone insects in the food web. Okay, so we want to plant keystone species of her uh, herbaceous plants and trees. And I, I have that list for you uh, in your handouts. And uh, I just wanted everybody to know that goldenrods are the top ranked her herbaceous plant for, di for biodiversity. And I know people still may think that they cause hay fever, but it's actually ragweed. And they do provide food and shelter for over 115 butterfly and moth species. And I have seven different kinds in my yard. Um, there are, I think, over 150 native ones. But what you need to do is look for some that are appropriate for garden areas. And um, they attract 11 native bee species that depend specifically just on their flowers for nectar and pollen. And uh, of course they bloom when the monarchs are flying back to Mexico. And so they're full of nectar uh, for them as, and of course helps, they help fuel their flights. And of course songbirds eat their seeds. There is a wasp that um, attacks the, um, the goldenrod and makes a gall on it. And uh, the winter birds love this and it's a very nutritious food for them. Okay, so your most uh, important plants uh, are trees. And that includes oaks, American plum, river birch, hickory, pine, uh, and willow. And of course, blueberries are listed here. They're, they're a shrub or they can be a small tree. But blueberries, if you grow blueberries, that they attract over 200 different kinds of uh, insects. So they're very important. And I do, uh, my yard is really hot and dry, so I grow mine in, in pots. Okay, and so the next thing that I want to talk about that's so important if you're going to restore native habitat are hedgerows or living fences. And all of us have canopy trees in our yard. And mine are mostly pine trees and uh, maple trees. But what we want underneath that is so important to our wildlife is our ornamental or understory. And this includes our do uh, dogwoods, service berries, redbirds, willow, willows, hop trees, pawpaw trees, elderberry trees, and sassafras trees. All of these trees attract a large number of insects and they're also host plants for butterflies and moths. And then our next layer that we want to establish is our shrub layer and our herbaceous layer. And so that would be our viburnums, our blueberries, spice bush, all of these different types of um, native plants. Our grasses are very important. Little blue stem grass are so important. Aromatic asters, goldenrod, Maryland golden aster, liatris, and milkweed. And this is a powerful way to restore the ecology of a yard. I was gonna show you what I did in my uh, yard. Uh, when I took over, when I first moved there in 2020, um, we had to remove most of the plant material because it was invasive. And so we cleared it to the fence and you can see there's nothing really uh, under this pine tree right here. But over about 10 years, I have created uh, 20, uh, 20 foot depth of um, uh, understory. So this is my herbaceous level. And then these are the trees. This is a pawpaw tree. I have sassafras trees. I have hop trees. And so this is the very uh, wonderful uh, wildlife habitat. And I try not to ever enter this area back here and leave it for cover and um, reproduction. Um, for, uh, for birds' nests and things like that. And also all of us have non-native plants. I have a lot of non-native plants in my yard. I have these gorgeous um, uh, crepe myrtle trees that I actually don't attract any insects. And so what I've done to make this area more nutritious is to add native plants where, where I've uh, added our native 
uh, hydrangeas, uh, oak leaf hydrangeas, and nine barks. So that's a way that you um, develop your yard. Also, um, Lookout Mountain, we don't have uh, sidewalks. We just have, um, we actually have uh, ditches full of uh, rocks and uh, gravel. And so I have planted the ditches on uh, either side of my yard and I have found out what will grow there. One of the one most wonderful plants is a Trilobia rebecchia, frostweed, prairie rose, and then of course, green-headed coneflower, Maryland aster, goldenrod, and echinacea. So that makes this area very, instead of being very, very nutritious, for um, all of the insects that they attract. Uh, we wanna always plant in multiples or three or more, and we wanna plant close together. So we don't want this, we want this. And that's uh, what I go for in my yard. The picture, uh, if you come in my yard, everything is growing very close together. And of course this helps with uh, the weeds too. Okay, the other thing that we wanna create in our yards are caterpillar pupate, pupation sites. And that's because caterpillars spend part of their lives in trees, and then they usually complete their life cycle uh, under the leaf litter or underground. Uh, the queen bumblebees hibernate in cavities under plants and under leaf litter. Uh, butterflies and moths, such as swallowtails, uh, the fritillaries, uh, the lunar moths, usually overwinter as a chrysalis. Okay, we don't want to spray or use pesticides, fungicides, or high nitrogen fertilizers. And this is an alarming statistic uh, that home gardeners use up to 10 times more chemical pesticides per, per acre on their farms than farmers, on their lawns than farmers. And they spend more per acre to maintain their lawns than farmers spend per agricultural acre. Okay, so spray yourself and not your yard. The mosquito um, industry advertises um, natural spray that doesn't kill anything but um, mosquitoes, but remember mosquitoes are insects and these sprays cannot discriminate between good and bad um, insects. And then we want nesting sites and water are so essential. And these, remember that our bees need water. This happens to be uh, one that I have in my yard and it did attract um, did attract the honeybees, but our native bees uh, like water too. And if you put water, I mean, and rocks in there, then they won't drown. Okay, and the other thing that we want to do is keep our leaves. That's the one of the most nutritious things that you can add to your beds and under your trees. Uh, so, and we want to keep our yard safe for our non-insect predators who eat the insects. So that would be birds, toads, bats, and turtles. And I wondered, uh, this is a uh, box turtle. And uh, I know a lot of you probably have them in your uh, yards and they're, they're such a wonderful asset in your yard. Okay, welcome bugs into your yard and slow the rate of extinction by planting natives. You might just save the world. Uh, here's some information on no-till gardening if you want it. I use Joe the Gardener website a lot. He, has, he is a big conservationist and almost anything that you wanna know about anything you can find on his website, I really like um, his website. And he has interviews with all of the most prominent conservationists today, Doug Ptolemy, Heather Holm, all of those people are on his website. And there's also podcasts if you like podcasts. Also, I want to um, recommend the um, Tennessee Valley chapter of Wild Ones website. Um, our programs, uh, I am an, a member of Wild Ones and our programs are open and free to the public once a month. 
Uh, we have a certificate in native plants if you want to learn more about native plants. We have planting information, which has all of the charts and information about how to, um, what plants to put where, and also where to buy native plants. And we have a list of all the areas and all the nurseries. Also, I use these uh, three sites a lot. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is just a great site to go to. Uh, some of you may know about the Mount Cuba Center. This is a research center uh, that is in the Northeast and it has wonderful information about uh, the field trials they've done on native uh, plants. And then of course, I love New Moon uh, website. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of information. And one of the things that I love a lot of times I buy plants because I know they're the right plant, but I don't know what to uh, plant with them. And so this has a lot of great information on landscape use and what companion and understory plants to uh, pair with them. And learn about pruning and pest control. I highly recommend Joe the Gardener again, and learn about the Chelsea Chop, because if you have native plants, they never uh, uh, are the height that they're supposed to be. They're always taller because they're so vigorous. And so you have to learn how to uh, prune them uh, to keep them in, in shape and to look beautiful because you want your, your wildflower garden to look beautiful. And then I highly recommend this book, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. I get so, I, it's sort of like my Bible. And so I'm going to leave you with this idea, into the garden I go to lose my mind and find my soul. And so I hope um, you have enjoyed it. And I would um, be glad to answer questions. Um, I don't know how uh, Suzanne wants to do that. Uh, people can unmute. There are a couple of questions that came into the chat. Okay. Um, you want to read them to me? Yeah. One was... Um, Sandy Lusk, uh, okay. list, of, list of insects to host plants. Is that one of your handouts? That is, that is. I have a complete list of all the host plants for the Southeast. Okay, so that's one of the what, um, yes. uh, attachments that was sent with yes. the uh, yes. message that went out today. That basically Right, that, that's correct. Okay. And most of these you can find at Reflection Writing. Mm -hmm. But and, and I also wanted to say that the wild ones are having a plant sale, a native plant sale on October the 1st, and we're going to have uh, nurseries from all over the southeast there. I think there'll be probably seven to nine nurseries. And so that is a good place to uh, start uh, your garden or add to your garden. And uh, of course, the fall is such a good time to plant because um, the earth will be, it will not be as hot. And also, so the root systems can get established during the winter rains, which are really good for your plants. And, and wild ones will be at the uh, Master Gardener's Fall Festival the week before, yes, correct? Yes, they, they will be there the week, week before and we will hand out information about that plant sale. Okay, that's good. Um, let's see. Uh, Cindy Goodrick had a message. Are lantanas invasive or bad for pollinators? No, you know, no. they're actually, you know, uh, lantanas are actually native to the Southwest and into Mexico. And so they are a native plant. And I do have them in my yard because uh, I have such a hot, dry yard and they are very drought tolerant and they're not invasive in the Southeast. They are invasive, I think in Australia where they have been planted, but no, they are not. And they're very hardy and you don't ever have to water them except when you establish them in the spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have them uh, perennial. There are two kinds, right? There's perennial lantana which, uh, and then there's the kind that you usually find in hanging baskets, which is the annual, but I have, I have perennial antenna and, and I've got until they, they don't come up in early spring, but they, at least mine last until 
uh, the heavy frost in November. Right. So they, and the what, I have, mm -hmm. yeah, go on. Well, I was just going to say, in order for them to be a perennial, you don't want to cut them back in the winter because their stems are hollow. And if we have heavy rains, it can drown the roots. So don't cut them back until April and then cut them back to the ground uh, because they come up from the roots. They don't come up from the stems mm -hmm. because the stems die. So that's how you make them a perennial. Oh, okay. So just yeah. leave them all there in the winter? Yes, you just leave the, the stems up. They'll die and you just leave them up. I know they look bad, but you know it's real important to leave your, if you can, to leave your uh, stalks up over winter because you have uh, native bees that will uh, nest in the hollow uh, stalks. And you have, uh, of course, uh, birds that eat the seeds. You wanna leave all of your perennials up for seeds because your winter birds really depend on them. The only time that I uh, cut mine back is, is, is because I have uh, certain plants in my yard are attacked by what is known as the four striped bug. And it is a native bug and they lay their eggs in the stalks. So I cut my anise hyssop down and any um, uh, plant that's a member of the uh, mint family because they love mint, mint family plants. And what they do is they suck the, um, the moisture out of the leaves and they crumple up and they look really bad. I was going to show that, but I was afraid I would go over. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can find out a lot about natural pest control if you get that well-tended perennial garden book or you can go to Joe the gardener and that it give you all sorts of ideas on how to control uh, pests that you have in your yard in an organic way. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Um, there was a question, there was a question about a slide you had. Okay. Uh, now, just letting everybody know that this presentation is on our Facebook page, if you're on Facebook. And you can go back and look at it and then freeze a frame to get some of the information. But you had mentioned a beneficial insect book that was yes. before the slide of beneficial insects. Yeah. I'll go, I can go back. I can go back to it. I'll go back to it. Okay. Um, and before we end and before everybody leaves, uh, take uh, unmute yourselves and take put your videos on and let's all give Ann a round of applause. Uh, there are all kinds of really great compliments. So, okay. Well, so, thank you. I really enjoyed talking with you. And I did want you to know you can, um, my email, I'm Master Gardener. So my email is on the uh, list and you can call me, text me, email me. I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. That is sort of what I do. Uh, up here, I've helped lots of people um, decide what to plant in their gardens. And you are welcome also to come to my garden if you want to. It was on the Master Gardener Tour this year, so you may have missed it, but um, I'll be glad to have you come and I can talk to you about how I have developed my yard. And remember, start small. And if you can only plant in pots, plant in pots. That's just as important as trying to have a, a large yard because uh, gardening is, is intensive. And remember, we have, we have gardens. We do not have landscapes. Our landscape, because landscapes we think of as being static, that we only add um, um, mulch to them every year. But remember, gardening requires a lot of um, participation with your plants. That's great. Also, people, um, if you go to the place where you write a message in the chat, there are three little dots next to the little emoji face. If you click on that, you can save the chat. And it, then you have to hunt for it. But you can save the chat in case there's, I put some web links in and some other stuff, um, if that's helpful to you. And um, uh, 
and then you could just go back and look at the presentation on Facebook. And <laughs> at some point, we're going to try to get this on our YouTube channel as well, because this is really information that needs to be absorbed more than once. I feel like I like a tenth of it. Well, uh, I just hope everybody will take to heart what I said that our wildlife is is uh, declining drastically and our yards become uh, our um, conservation areas, our a mini park. And uh, so it's just real important that we invite them into our yards to try to save. All right, a round of applause for Ann. <laughs> Thank you. It was, was my great. pleasure. My you are pleasure. definitely the PowerPoint queen of all time. <laughs> no question. <Okay. laughs> no question. I will now, I'm going to just stop the live stream. Thank you.